Hello everybody, I will introduce myself in a second. My name is Elam and uh, I will uh, give you two lectures on uh, statistics in high energy physics. Today will be the first one, so let me now share the slides. Okay, the slides now. Okay, so there will be two lectures. The first one will be on uh, profile likelihood in which I will also explain the terms like Asimov, CLS, and I will talk about exclusion. In the second lecture, I will talk about discovery and the look also effect. About me, I'm a professor of physics at the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel. I also work at CERN. And uh, my history is, uh, I'm very old. In the 80s and 90s, I was at CERN working at a very old accelerator called LEP, Large Ele Electron Positron Collider, where you collided electrons with anti-electrons. And at that time, there were four experiments. One of them was called OPAL. I was OPAL Higgs convener. In the 2000s, I was working in something that didn't happen that is called Tesla. This is a linear collider, which was supposed to be in Germany and didn't happen. And I was the prospective Higgs convener. I was preparing things, but nothing happened. In the 2010s, uh, that was uh, speaking every hand in his career. We were the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, which I hope you know what's about. I was the statistics convener of Atlas, and then I was the Higgs convener during the year 2011 to 2014, that's the years of the his discovery. And then I was the LHC combination, the first LHC combination his convener. And at the present, I actually do applications of deep learning in high energy physics and uh, in analysis, I'm, I'm mainly involved with the flavor tag, with the charm tag mainly, and the cell for X decay to charm, which is not yet uh, well established. So this is me, and you can you saw me before, you see my picture here. And uh, I think I can start my lecture now. So basically, it's all about number. And uh, if I have collisions, and I have, say, uh, L collisions per second per centimeter square, I can actually integrate over the time. And each collision I call an event. So I have uh, L events per centimeter square. That's the kind of the cross section. If I multiply it by the cross section of a specific process, which we call sigma, and I have some efficiency for detection, which we call F efficiency, then the number of expected signal events that I expect to see, and by signal, I mean those that are described by the cross section sigma, they can be big on the cross section describes some process. So the number expected event from this process is the multiplication of the luminosity by the cross section by the efficiency. For this lecture, I will ignore the efficiency, assume it's just L times sigma, just not to drag the term all the time. So have a look, this is a very, very important formula and very simple. So some preliminaries. So we'll take the signal as the Higgs because it really happens, so we have a real example. Unfortunately, that's the only one. So the Higgs hypothesis is that of a signal, the number of expected signal events at some mass mh will be the luminosity, which I just defined, times the cross section, times the efficiency. In a Compton experiment, the number of events that we expect to see must involve also the background. Background and events which have similar, similar signature as the signal and normally cannot be separated, so you have to count them as well. So M is uh, mu S plus D, where mu is called the signal strength and is defined by the ratio of the observed cross-section to the expected cross-section, which I call the standard model cross-section. So the observed cross-section is the luminosity times the observed cross-section, and the expected cross and the expected number of events is the luminosity times the expected cross section from the standard model. The luminosity cancels out, and I get that it's the ratio between the cross section, the observed cross section, and the expected cross section. Now you see what happens. If mu equals one, then I will get simply S plus B. If there is no signal, then the number of observed events will simply be the background. So there are two hypotheses. One, that 
there is a no signal, only background, so we will call it H0 because mu is zero. And one, when there is a Higgs, which is exactly the one expected from the standard model, and we call it H1 because mu equals one. So if you look again at uh, this n equal mu s plus b, this is your magic formula. Mu equals one is where there is a signal, mu equals zero is when there is no signal. And if you, mu is something in between, we have to kind of operate our brains and try to see what's going on. So the story of uh, discovery and exclusion is the story of two hypotheses. One is called the null hypothesis, is one is called the alternative hypothesis. What we do is we define some null hypothesis and we test it. We test it and we try to reject it. We try to reject it and we either fail to reject it or we reject it in favor of some alternative hypothesis. So again, there are two possibilities, fail to reject it or reject it in favor of the alternative hypothesis. So if we define the null hypothesis of H0, which is the standard model without the Higgs, background only, and the alternative hypothesis H1 is the standard model with the Higgs, then if we reject the background hypothesis in favor of the H1 hypothesis, which is the background plus signal, this is what we call a discovery. We reject the background only hypothesis in favor of uh, an hypothesis of the Higgs with the mass mh plus the background. Now, how do we quantify this rejection? We quantify this rejection by something we call p-value. So again, when the null hypothesis is defined as the background only hypothesis, H0, rejecting it leads to a discovery. Now you reject it in favor of an alternative hypothesis which has to be defined in some specific mass. Okay, you, it has to be defined in some specific mass. That's the only way you can reject it. Now we swap the hypothesis and let's call the null hypothesis, the one that we test H1, which is the standard model with our signal. I, I write a Higgs, but it can be supersymmetry, it can be exotics, it can be anything you have in mind. So now we talk, when we say rejecting the null hypothesis, we're rejecting H1 in favor of H0. What does it mean that I reject S plus B, where S is defined as some mass MH? If I reject the signal hypothesis, it means that I exclude the existence of a signal at that mass. So excluding H1 at MH, meaning in this context, excluding the Higgs with a mass MH. Again, rejection is quantified by something we call P value. So if I summarize, if the null hypothesis is H0, then rejecting H0 is a discovery. If the null hypothesis is H1 signal, then rejecting H1 is what we call exclusion. Now, another basic term and fundamental term is what we call likelihood. Likelihood is the compatibility of an hypothesis with a given data set. So the likelihood of some hypothesis H is a probability to see the data that we see given the hypothesis. I'm not gonna go into that, but I want to make sure that you understand that likelihood is not the probability of the hypothesis given the data. It's not the probability of the hypothesis given the data. This is something very difficult to answer because you need to know something about the hypothesis how likely is the hypothesis in order to ask what is the probability of the hypothesis given the data? The only question that you can smoothly answer, and this is called the frequentist approach, and that's the one I take here, is what is the probability to observe the data that we observed given the hypothesis? I say, okay, let's assume the hypothesis is there. So what's the probability to see the data? This is called the likelihood. So, the first step in any hypothesis test was to state, to define the null hypothesis. We saw the two possibilities in our case, H0 and H1. And so we define the null hypothesis, say H0, and the alternative hypothesis, say H1, so that we can swap them. Now comes the difficult part. In order to quantify, what do we mean by rejection? 
We need something we call test statistic, some flag, some quantity, which we will measure. And by its result, we will decide how much, how much likely is an hypothesis or not. You'll see in a second how it works. So you compute from your observation one value, which is this test statistics under the data that we have. It's called Q observed. And we decide based on this Q observed, it's one number, one number which we get after we run for say a year or two or three or five years. It's one number. Based on this one number, which we call Q observed, we decide either we fail to reject another hypothesis, so we live with it, or we reject it in favor of an alternative hypothesis. So far, it happened to us really only one time in 2012 that we rejected the background null hypothesis in favor of an hypothesis of a Higgs at a mass of 125 GeV. So how do we construct a test statistics? How do we make a decision? Let's take a case study of spin. So this is called the histogram. We measure some angle theta, doesn't matter of what. This is an angle which has to do with the decay of a spin zero particle, what we call a scalar particle, or a spin one particle, which we call a vector particle. A spin zero distribution will look like the red one. So it's like a bump, say. And uh, the spin one will look like a curve here, which goes down, you see, like a hole here. So now we have to look at our data, run it for a year or two or whatever, and decide if the data is compatible with the spin zero or the spin one, with the red or the blue. This is an example of a data, and we have to decide is it compatible with the red or the blue. I think here you will look at say, mm, it looks more compatible with the spin zero, but how do we quantify how compatible? So if we reject the spin one, we have to quantify it. In what confidence level, how sure we are that we reject the spin one hypothesis here. In this case, for example, you would say, ah, it looks like the data is more compatible with spin one. So perhaps we can reject the spin zero hypothesis. But again, what is the confidence of this rejection? And here, wow, you don't really know what to do. I mean, if you use your imagination, it can describe both the spin zero and the spin one. So which one is which? So how do you make some statement about the compatibility of the data with any of the hypotheses? So to do this, we define, and in this example, I define what I call the Neiman Pearson test statistics, which is the likelihood ratio of one hypothesis with respect to the other. There is a, a lemma by Neiman Pearson that says that this is sort of the best, the most powerful test statistic. I will not go into what it means. It doesn't really matter at this point. It means that it's powerful and we'll see in a second what it means. So now I go and I, I need to collect data for a year, say. There is only one LHC, but Data fluctuates statistically, it has a statistical fluctuation. If I run LHC this year, or I run LHC next year, and I run LHC another year, or I run LHC for a million years, every time I'll get a different result. But I cannot run LHC a million times. I can do it with simulation. So I simulate LHC, I simulate LHC, every time I run it for a year with the luminosity that is equivalent for a year, and I ask, what is the this quantity, which is called Q Neiman Pearson, which is two log of likelihood of H0 over likelihood of H1. Note that I write the likelihood of H0 given X, which equals the probability of X given H0. That's just to remind you that the likelihood somehow 
depends on the data as well. The data changes, the likelihood changes, okay? But it's the likelihood of the H0 hypothesis divided by the likelihood of H1 hypothesis. So after a year of run, this is just one number, Q, and it's given here. Now I simply start to simulate another LHC experiment and another LHC experiment, and every time I get a different number. Look, every time I get a different number with a, each LHC experiment. Now, if my Q is very, very low, very negative, it means that I'm in J equals zero, the spin is zero. Because what does it mean? That the data is actually compatible more with the spin zero. If my Q is very, very high, then it means that I'm in spin one. So let's see how it looks on the point of view of the data. Let's play with it until, okay, look. This is a very, very low Q, very, very low Q which means that uh, my data should be compatible with the spin zero. So if you look at the data here, it really looks compatible more with the red. You see here that it looks compatible with the red and west with the blue. So you can guess that for experiments that fluctuate and give me like spin one, I will actually get a data which is, let's try to look for one. I'm running, I'm running. It's very hard to get, you know why? Because, ah, okay. You see, now the data is more compatible with the blue. The reason is that all the experiments that generate here are spin zero experiments. So the data is naturally more compatible with spin zero. But from time to time, even a spin zero data gives us something that is compatible with a spin one. So this is like, you have a million LHC experiment and there is a probability that some of them will give us results that are actually compatible more with the alternative hypothesis, which is actually wrong. So there is some error rate here. Now, if I play the same game and I generate only experiment with spin one, now I play the same game exactly Now, if I look here, okay, let look here. Okay, ah, stop, stop, stop. Okay, great. These experiments give me a very high result, which is very compatible with spin one. And indeed, you see that the data is very compatible with spin one. This is one LHC experiment after a year, but with simulation. If I will kind of look here, this is, even though I generated a spin one, even though I generated spin one, the data looks more like a spin zero because if you look at the data, it fluctuates, but the mathematics tell us that it's more compatible with the red than with the blue. So now you, I hope you understand the, the, the name of the game. So I have now two distributions. One of the test statistics under the H0 hypothesis and one of the test statistics under H1. Under means that I generate experiment with H0. So this is what I get. Here I generate experiment with H1, here is what I get. So I have two distributions, two probability distribution function, two BDF of the state statistics. One under the null hypothesis and one under the alternative hypothesis. So the red will be in this case, the distribution of the test statistics under the null hypothesis, the red, and the blue is f of q given r. So it is division of the test statistics under the alternative hypothesis. Now I go and do the real experiment with data, real data, no simulation, no simulation, and I get one number, which is my q observation, which you see here. Now what do I do with it? I look at my q observed, and I need to make some decision based upon it. But I have the red and the blue PDFs and I can do a lot. So this area under the red here is called p-value because this is the probability under the assumption of the null hypothesis of finding data that is incompatible with H null because if I go to the right, I'm more alternative-like. I'm more alternative-like. 
So the red area is what is the probability that the null hypothesis is true and still I get results that look like the alternative hypothesis. This is called p-value. This is called the p-value of the null hypothesis, p-null. Now, hopefully this is very, very low because normally if my null hypothesis is true, I expect that most experiments will give me results which are compatible with the null hypothesis. Only a few give us results which are incompatible with the null hypothesis under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. If I look now at the blue area here, what is this? Given this Q observation, this is the probability that the alternative hypothesis is true, but it gives us results which is more compatible in the direction of the null hypothesis. So this is called the p-value of the alternative hypothesis. It's a probability under the assumption of the alternative hypothesis, which will give us the blue PBF, of finding data which is more incompatible with the prediction of the alternative hypothesis, more goes to the left. So now I just take, since the area of each one of the PDFs, that's how I normalize this, the area is exactly one because it's probability distribution. I look at one minus P alt, and this we define as the power, the power of the test. Because what does it mean? It means, it means that it's the probability, it's a probability, there's something that I want to get rid of here, which is disturbing me. You don't see the right thing. Give me a second. Yeah, okay, now it's better. Yeah. So, what it means is, uh, okay, it's a probability that I reject the null hypothesis when the alternative hypothesis is true. It's all this blue area with an area which is one minus P alt. It's a probability that I reject another hypothesis and the alternative is true. This is good stuff. This is when I, in a justified way, I reject another hypothesis because the alternative is true. So it's not enough to look only at the p-value, the probability that I reject another hypothesis in order to reject another hypothesis. If say the p-null, this red area below, if this red area below is say 1%, if this area below is 1%, then I say, ah, so probably I can reject the null hypothesis. No, but you want to make sure that you reject it while the alternative hypothesis is true. So you want that the power of the test will be high. So you want that the blue area, which is denoted by 1 minus P alt, will be large. So that's why people defined something called the uh, CLS, but... Uh, Let's, let's see, let me skip this, okay? So, oh, I don't know where did it go. I lost my CLS, okay. Okay, I will probably come to CLS later. I don't know where it disappeared, I lost it, okay. So the remember that the power is one minus the P alt. Okay, I don't have a pen here, so I cannot do what I want. So it's like one slide got lost. Let me see if it simply skipped there. Okay, I don't know, maybe I edited the slides and then put it later. Okay, so you remember that the power is one minus P alt and the P value is P null. Now, what is the meaning of taking more luminosity? If I take more luminosity, I increase the power. This is why we have to wait for more statistics and more statistics because we want the test, the statistical test to be meaningful. So for example, for example, if, if my, my luminosity is low, say the number of collisions per experiment in this uh, Monte Carlo that I did is 100, and this is the, the p-value of the area here. Can you see the, I hope you can see the arrow here, the area here, because I test the red, I test the red hypothesis. The power is the blue. So what you see is that the power is very, very low. Because while I reject the red hypothesis, <laughs> the blue can still be wrong. There's no high probability for the blue to be right. So the power is only 
If I increase the luminosity to 300 events, you see that the power increases to 30%. If I increase the luminosity to 500 events, the power is 44%. The power is the, this area where the, the alternative hypothesis is true when the null hypothesis is wrong, I reject it. If I increase the luminosity to 700, then the power is 55%. So the more the luminosity, the power of the test is bigger. You see, now I have already 68.9% power. The power is this area here. The power is this area here, 68.9%. And the p-value is kept the same value. Yeah, now I come to CLS because this is something you probably heard about. So what's the idea of the CLS? The idea of the CLS to remember that we want to make sure that while we reject the null hypothesis, the alternative hypothesis is true. So we defined a modified p-value, which we call p prime, which is the original p-value divided by the power. So if the power is very, very low and equal to p-null, p-null for rejection is usually say 5%, 1%. So if the power is also 5% or 1%, the ratio will be 100% and we cannot reject it. So this modified p-value is called CLS and was suggested many, many years ago by a guy named Birnbaum and then uh, rediscovered by uh, Alex Reed. So in our example, when we test the spin, this is a real result from the Atlas experiment. So H0 is called the zero plus hypothesis and H1 is the zero minus hypothesis. You know that the Higgs is a zero plus with a parity of plus, zero plus. So here is what we see. We see that the p-value is this red, red area here. P-value is 2.2%. Uh, P-H0, sorry, something. Sorry. Um, ah, okay, okay. We test the zero minus hypothesis in order to reject it in favor of the zero plus hypothesis. Okay, the zero plus is the blue one, and the zero minus is the red one. We want to reject it because the x is a zero plus. We want to reject the zero minus in favor of the zero plus. So our observation is this number here. So the p-value is defined with respect to the null hypothesis, which is a zero minus. So the p-value is this area here. The uh, Ilam, we cannot, if you are pointing on the screen, I, I don't see your pointer. I'm not sure. Oh, you don't see a pointer, so I will start by talking, okay? If you look at the right plot, look at the red dashed area below. This red dashed dash area is the observed p-value, and it is 1.5%. That's the observed p-value. Now, the dashed blue one is the p alt is actually the P, it's 31%, okay? It's PH0 at, it's 31%. And the power is one minus 31%, so it's 69%. So the, if you look at the bottom left, the modified p-value, which you call CLS, will be the p-value, 1.5%, divided by one minus 31%. So instead of 1.5%, it's 2.2%. So if our criteria for rejection is 5%, we feel comfortable to reject the zero minus hypothesis in favor of the zero plus hypothesis. And the way we, the way we express it in the paper is that the zero minus hypothesis, see at the bottom left, is excluded at the 97.8, because that's 100 minus 2.2, 97.8% confidence level in favor of the zero plus hypothesis. One thing I need to explain here is uh, what is the history and uh, what is the convention of p-values? So the p-values has to do with Gaussian significance. So if the distribution of our test statistics were purely Gaussian, then there is a correspondence between the p-value, which is the dark blue area on the right, and how far you are from the mean, how many standard deviations you are from the mean. 
which is Z sigma. Z is the number of standard deviation. So for example, if I'm far away from the mean by five standard deviation, then it's really, really incompatible with the data because it's the middle where you're compatible with the data. And this is where you feel comfortable to reject an effort to this and the p-value turns out to be 2.9, 10 to the minus seven. So let's summarize. When testing the background hypothesis in favor of some signal hypothesis, it's custom to use a measure of p-value of 2.9, 10 to the minus seven, which as we saw is uh, equivalent to five standard deviation. So if the p-value of the background hypothesis is less than 2.9, 10 to the minus seven, we check the background hypothesis and we call it a discovery. However, if we try to reject a signal hypothesis, so we test the S plus B hypothesis, usually we are less strict. We set this, uh, this criterion to 5%. So we are much easier to reject the signal hypothesis than the background. And why is that so? Because once we reject the background and we declare, hey, we discovered a new signal, this is news. This is something that all the world will talk about. And uh, we talk next time on the Lucas effect and we'll explain where the five sigma comes from, but you'll see where it comes from. But this is real news and you don't want to regret tomorrow because you look stupid. However, if I say tomorrow that I think that I exclude the Higgs with the a mass of 120 GeV and uh, suddenly the statistics fluctuation changes its face and suddenly I see the Higgs, I'll just say, okay, I just rejected it at the 5% confidence level. So I still left an error range of 5%. I could be wrong 5%. So I was wrong. I had a statistic fluctuation, which is one to 25%. So probably there is a history and these things happen. So this is kind of a custom in high energy physics. Exclusion done at the level of 5%. This is less strict than discovery, which is very strict than the level of 2.9, 10 to the minus seven, which means that there is an error probability of something like less than one in a million that I declare a discovery and it's wrong. While there is an error probability of one to 20 that when I exclude the signal, it is wrong and the signal is there. That's a long history of energy physics and that's uh, the way it is. Okay, I think that if there is a question, I would like to take it here because I now move to proper light. Uh, I, I have a question. Yeah. Can you please go back to slide 32? Yeah. Um, I, 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 just, I just wanted to make sure that I understand, uh, understand what you explained, right? Yeah. So, <clears throat> The, uh, the 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 p the p value the, the observed p value for the null hypothesis is, is is the area of the of the dashed blue curve. No, of the of of, of which hypothesis? The null hypothesis. The null here is the red. Oh, sorry. So, the H H zero H zero is the alternative hypothesis. Is that yeah, what you're yeah. Saying? In this case, the H zero is the alternative. Okay. Cool. So. Uh, the, the, so the null hypothesis is the red one, and the dashed red area is the p-value of the of the red hypothesis. And you see also that it's very small. That's a 1.5 percent. And then you subtract one from the. No, G. no, 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 no. Now I look at the alternative hypothesis, the blue one. The blue one. Okay. And I will calculate one minus p alt. Okay. So so the alternative so 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 p alt is the dashed blue area. Yeah. It's 31%. So one minus P alt is the one that I don't plot. It's the blue area on top of the dash red. And this one actually is the probability that while rejecting the null hypothesis, the blue hypothesis is correct. Because in all these cases, the, the blue hypothesis is correct, right? Okay. So in 70% of the cases, the blue hypothesis is correct while the null hypothesis is rejected which is the power, okay? I want to reject the, 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 the null red hypothesis and make sure that uh, in a high percentage, I reject it for something that is correct. 
in this case, 71%. So you see, I ask another question here. While rejecting another hypothesis, I ask myself, while I reject another hypothesis, in what percentage the alternative hypothesis is true? Because it's important that I don't just reject another hypothesis and the, yeah. the alternative is wrong. So I wanted the power, the power is the probability that another hypothesis is correct while I reject the, the, the alternative hypothesis is correct while I reject the another hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. I want this power to be high. And this power is one minus P R. Is that clear now? Okay, yeah, yeah, no, that, <clears throat> that, that, that's clear, yeah. Thank you. Is there another question? Okay, I will move on. Sorry, I just wanted to clear something up, but the, 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 the subscript for 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 the p value the 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 last blue one is it supposed to be h zero or is h one? Here, here the null hypothesis is defined as the red one h one. Yeah. The alternative hypothesis is defined as the blue one h zero. So p null is p zero and p alt is p one. Yes. Sorry, 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 sorry. You see, I meant the null hypothesis is h one p one in this case. P1 in this case is the P null, is the P value, what we call the P value. And P alt here is P0. This is the, you see, in historically, historically, usually the null hypothesis was defined as the beggar and you try to make the discovery. So everybody start talk of P value as P0, but forget about it. You can define the null hypothesis anything you like. If I define the null hypothesis here as H1, then P1 is P null, which is this case here. And P alt is P0 in this case here. All you have to do is sit down with yourself and decide which one is the null, which means which one you want to reject in favor of the alternative hypothesis. So ask yourself, what is the alternative hypothesis? And that's how you define your P null and P alt. So in this case, P null is P1, P alt is P0, and the, the power is one minus P0 in this case. And you see it on your bottom left here. The CLA, I, love, yeah. I have a question then to follow up. Is uh, what determines the choice of what is uh, the null? Yeah, what determines the choice is what is the test I want to do? Which hypothesis I want to test in order to reject it? So mm. if I want to make a discovery, I test the Bergen hypothesis because I want to reject it in favor of a signal if it's there. I want to test if background is real or there is something, some fluctuation, high fluctuation on top of the background. So in this case, I decided my null hypothesis is the background only, so it's H0. Now, if I want to ask a different question, like, like in which probability I believe the signal hypothesis. So I try to reject it. I try to reject it. If I manage to reject the signal hypothesis, I say, ah, there is no signal. So in this case, I define the null hypothesis as a signal hypothesis, but I try to reject it in favor of the background hypothesis. So there's also a meaning of a power here. Because if I reject a signal hypothesis, which is, very, suppose that my signal is so, so small that S plus B equals about B. The signal is very, very small. So it will be very difficult to reject the signal because the distribution of S plus B will be very similar to the distribution of B. They will be very similar. So whatever you do, the power will always be very, very, very small because the B value of the P value of the signal, because S plus B is about B, if the signal is small, the P value of the signal of S plus B is very much the same as the P value of the background. So what will happen is that you will actually get that the, the power is very, very small. And therefore, you won't be able to, to reject. You won't be able to reject. Let me. So, put it so I think yeah. I made. I, no, no, I made. I made a, a wrong, a, a wrong statement. Now I want to, to, to correct myself. Yeah, it's it's very confusing. You see, it all confuses me. That, that's the point, and I don't have a board here. Okay, so suppose that my signal is very, very small. So S plus B is about B. I want to show you the problem, why they invented the CLS. 
So what happens is that uh, suppose I made some observation and the p-value for the, the p-value for the S plus B hypothesis is 1%. Now, since the background is very much like S plus B, what will happen is that the p-value for B only will be 99% because the two distribution will sit one on top of the other. So if one of them to the right is the tail is 1%, then the complement of the tail will be something like 99%. So what will happen is that the power will be one minus 99% will be again 1%. So if the p-value of the signal hypothesis will be 1% and the power will be 1%. So if I take the ratio of them, I get that the multiplied p-value is 100%, one over one. You have to sit down with yourselves and work it out, but uh, you can see it if, if I go back here, let me show you. See, this is a case where either the signal is very low or the luminosity is very low. When the luminosity is very low or the signal is very low, you see that the two distributions sit one on top of the other. So the p-value of the null hypothesis, the red, is say in this case, say it's 5%, but the complement, the, the power, which is the blue area to the left of the red, the blue area, I cannot plot it here, but it's the, it's actually the blue area to the left of the red. Do you understand me? You look at the blue, sure. you see the power, you look at the blue, and you look at the area of the blue to the left of the observation of the red arrow. You understand me? Uh -huh. This will be something like, you see, it's something like 90%. Right? This is yeah, something to the, to the left, yes. To the left. Yeah. So what you say is that your fee value will be 5% divided by 1 minus, I don't know, something like 80%. So it will be 5% divided by 20%. So it will become 25% and you cannot make a rejection. And it makes sense because the signal and the background are very much similar here. Well, if you increase the luminosity, now they are separated. When they are separated, you see that the power decreases. 68%. So now, if your p-value is 5%, your modified p-value will be 5% divided by 70%, will be, I don't know, uh, something like 7% here, which also is not so high. So now you can make a rejection, not at the 95%, but at the 93%. Um, so this, can, this situation happens either with the low luminosity, that they are very much alike, or when the signal is very low. When the signal is very low and S plus B equals B, the two distribution will overlap and you won't be able to make a test. It makes sense because you cannot separate between the hypothesis. In two cases, either the luminosity is very low or the two hypotheses are very much alike, so the signal is very, very small. So this is why you need huge luminosity when the signal is small to separate the two hypotheses. Yeah, I never saw anybody explain it like this, but I think it really shows you the power of luminosity. When you increase the luminosity, the power increases and you can make a separation. Okay, I think I need to go on. Okay, things get complicated because the, the test statistics we like to use is something called proper likelihood because it has a very nice uh, characteristics which you'll see in a second. Now, probably I should talk about the definition of this for an hour or send you home and come back in a week and continue talking because it's very hard to understand it. But uh, I will try to explain it. The test statistic is still a likelihood ratio, but it's the likelihood ratio of the, say, S, new S plus B hypothesis with respect to the best hypothesis, the one that the data tells me is the most likely one. Okay, you see that since the denominator, since the denominator is always the maximum likelihood, because it means that if you look now at the second row on the left box, second row on the left box, and look at the denominator, you take the maximum likelihood where you scan over the signal strength and the background until you get the maximum likelihood. 
So this is always bigger than the denominator. In the denominator, we scan the likelihood keeping mu fixed. So if I test mu equal one, it's L of S plus B. If I test mu equal zero, it's L of B. So I keep u fixed, but I scan and find the maximum with respect to b. Since in the denominator, I'll also let mu change, the likelihood in the bottom will always be bigger equal to the likelihood in the denominator. I hope you understand it. So this is always a fraction. The log of a fraction is always negative. So when I take minus two log of the fraction, I actually get always a positive number. So Q is always a positive number. Now, if the tested mu is very close to the observed mu, observed mu is given by mu hat. Mu hat is the mu which gives me the maximum likelihood. Mu hat is the mu which gives me the maximum likelihood. Look at the third row. All the rows are equivalent. If you look at the third row, the denominator is L of mu hat S plus B hat, which means that I scan and find the mu and the B which maximize the likelihood. So this is actually the measured mu by the data, the signal strength that the data actually likes the most, favorites, which gives me the maximum likelihood. If my test of mu equals mu hat, it's very much close to mu hat, then the denominator and the and the, the bottom and the top and the numerator will be equal. So it will be minus two log of one, so it will be zero. So when the tested mu agrees with that of the data, then my Q, my test statistics is zero. When the tested mu is incompatible with the data, then the likelihood of the numerator will be much smaller than the likelihood of the denominator, and this will be a very small fraction. So the log will be very negative, minus two log will be very positive. So what is the meaning of this? Mu hat is the, called the maximum likelihood, now you look at the right red box. Mu hat is the maximum likelihood estimator of mu. B hat is the maximum likelihood estimator of B. Now I define something which is very difficult for definition. That's why I always uh, say I explain it an hour and then you go home. But now we don't have an hour, so and we cannot go home and come back. So I look at B double head. B double head, all it means is that I fix mu to some value and I scan B. The B that gives me the maximum likelihood, given some mu, B sub mu, it's called B double hat. Have a look for a second. Okay, let's see how it looks like. Look at the, at the blue area on the left. This is actually the distribution of these test statistics under the null hypothesis. Most of the times, if I take experiment with a null hypothesis, and my data is compatible with a null hypothesis, most of the time the likelihood ratio is one, minus two log of it is zero, so you get actually a peak at zero. From time to time, this data, which is compatible with a null hypothesis, gives you something which is more compatible with the alternative hypothesis, so it can be large positive, and I go to the far right. So this can be the distribution of the null hypothesis under the null hypothesis. It can be f of q0 under h0 or f of q1 under h1. And here comes Wilkes theorem. He tells me, no matter what is the null hypothesis, the distribution of the test statistics, of the profile likelihood test statistics, which is the likelihood of the best likelihood, is always distributed like a chi square with one degree of freedom. This is what you see on the, on the blue area here. The red curve that you see here is a chi square with one degree of freedom. So it could be either f of q0, h0 is chi square with one degree of freedom, 
or f of q mu h mu will be transfer with one degree of freedom. And it doesn't matter what is the background. It doesn't care what is the background. The background is called a nuisance parameter. It doesn't care what is the nuisance parameter. There could be a background here, there could be other parameters which are irrelevant. As long as I do this procedure that you see here, the distribution of the null under the null will all of the test statistics under the null will always be a Kaiser with one degree of freedom. Doesn't matter. This is why we like to use the prophylaxis. So Will theorem tells me that the probability distribution function of the test statistic under the null hypothesis is always a chi-square with one degree of freedom. You see it on the right plot here, f of q0 under h0 is chi-square with one degree of freedom. The big question that we never knew the answer to was what is the probability distribution of the of the alternative hypothesis, if I test alternative hypothesis under the null hypothesis. This was a big mystery. I will go to it because this is the subject of this lecture. But uh, first of all, let me show you some classification of possible test statistics. We already saw uh, the lambda test statistics, which is the likelihood ratio of two hypotheses, but in the profile likelihood, there are a few possibilities, depends what is the purpose of what you want to test. If you want to make a discovery, you define Q0. Q0 is defined as minus two log of lambda of zero, which is defined here, which is L of zero divided of L of mu head. Theta is any nuisance parameter. I gave you an example of the background, and it can be many, that's why I put a sign of a vector. And you know what is theta double head? Theta double head means that I scan theta and find the maximum likelihood, fixing mu to be zero. In the numerator, in the denominator, both, I scan both mu and theta until I find the like, maximum likelihood. And why is this called minus two log of lambda of zero when mu hat is greater than zero and zero when mu hat is less than zero? Look at the middle column, first row. Because if I have a fluctuation, a down fluctuation of the background, down fluctuation of the background will give me a signal strength which is negative. The background suddenly fluctuates down, and instead of 100 events of background, I get 90. The new hat will be actually negative. It's something like minus 0.1 or something like this. But I don't want to reject the background hypothesis if I have a, a downward fluctuation of the background. I want to reject it only in favor of the signal hypothesis, of the alternative hypothesis. Signal means that there is an upper fluctuation. Instead of 100 events, I get 150 events. So if I have a downward fluctuation on the background, if instead of the expected background, I get less events, I don't reject the background. So downward fluctuation of the background will not serve as an evidence against the background. If I jump now to the fourth row and I look at Q mu mu, Q mu is means that I test the signal with a strength mu. For example, Q1 will be equivalent to what we talked before, test the signal hypothesis of the standard model, where mu equals one, S plus B. This time you see something strange. Q mu equals either minus two log of lambda of mu, if mu hat is less than mu, but zero and mu hat is greater than mu. What does it mean? It means that if the signal plus background is 150 event, the sort of uh, the predicted signal, because I don't know if I see it or not, the expected signal is one plus background is 150 events. If I see 200 events, wow, I don't want to reject the signal. So if mu hat is greater than one, I don't want to reject the signal. I want to reject the signal only if I don't see anything that looks like a signal. If I get, say, 100 events, I expect 150 and I get 100, then I want to reject the signal. So only if mu hat is less than one in this case, I want to reject the signal. If I have an excess of signal events, I don't want to reject the signal. So I don't want to use upward fluctuation of the signal as an evidence against the signal. These are the two difficult points that I wanted to say now.
So in the next, uh, say, uh, almost half an hour, I want to give another example, which is bump hunt. So there are two possibilities. I can decide on another hypothesis with the H0 or H mu or H1. So I will test H0 if I want to make a discovery of a new signal of a bump. I will test H1, let's call mu equal one here. If I want to exclude a signal at a specific mass. So I have the two test statistics defined here and I can try to play the game. So for this game, I generated events which are very inspired by the Higgs, just to, for pedagogic reason, where I took S over B to be 0.5%, and the width of the mass is dependent on the mass. As the mass of the signal increases, the mass of the expected signal, because I don't know if it's there or not, it's more smeared. Look at this. See what happens? It's very hard to exclude the very heavy Higgs because it's kind of becomes very wide. That's how it looks like, see? Now, I don't know what is the signal, but I have to take this into account. One last time. If I stop it, a Higgs will look like this. The 125 Higgs will look like this, you see? That's a 125 Higgs. An exotic Higgs, which is very high mass, it will be very hard to find it because you see the bump disappear because it becomes very, very wide. This is very real. This is very realistic example. The X is here, star model like, and an exotic X looks here. So I can have uh, LHC experiment will give me this distribution, or LHC experiments give another distribution. So here I want to to show the paper that uh, we did together with uh, Glenn Cohen, Carl Kramer, and uh, Ofer Vitalis, which is uh, the asymptotic form of a likelihood based test of new physics, where we defined also the Asimov data sets, and that's the one that is used by others in CMS for, for new physics since uh, 2010. So let's take a simple test statistics uh, just to make our life uh, very easy. Simply minus two log of lambda of nu, or lambda of u simply the likelihood of nu divided by the best likelihood, likelihood of nu. Ignore the nuisance parameters if you don't understand exactly what it was. It doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. All I want you to understand what is likelihood of mu, the likelihood of the hypothesis, which is denoted by H mu. If it's testing the background, it's likelihood of mu equal zero. If it's testing the signal, it's likelihood of mu equal one. And the data tells us what is the most favorable mu, because I scan mu and see which mu the data fits the best, so it gives me mu head. So this is L of mu divided by L of mu head. So here I come to a very difficult theorem from 1938, no, sorry, 1943, which 1938, from 1943, which is called what theorem, which takes some time to, to digest. What Walt taught us, he actually told us how to solve the distribution. What he told us, how would the distribution when I test H mu under some other hypothesis, mu prime, so example, if I test the signal hypothesis under the background hypothesis, how will the distribution look like? That's the one we didn't have. We know that the distribution of the background under the background, of the signal under the background is chi square. But what is the distribution of the signal under the background or the background under the signal? What does it mean, signal under the background? It means, it means that I test the signal, but I generate background on the experiment and look how the test statistic distributes. Or what is the distribution of the background under the signal? I test the background hypothesis, but I generate experiments with only signal. So what Walt told us is that this test statistics is actually equals mu minus mu hat squared divided by sigma mu hat squared. It looks like Chinese to some of you, I suppose, but you have to digest it. It means that mu hat, look at the, at the middle right, mu hat distribution 
distributed like a Gaussian with some sigma around some new prime. For example, for example, suppose the hypothesis, the hypothesis that I generate experiments with is the signal. Now I generate experiment with the signal, and every time I get a different mu hat. Sometimes it's one, but sometimes it fluctuates around one with some some sigma, some fluctuation, some. So mu hat distributes around one. So it tells me that the test statistics, if I test the background only hypothesis, will be T0 equals zero minus mu hat squared over sigma squared. So it's mu hat squared over sigma squared. I know it's difficult. I'm sorry, within the time frame that I have, it's very difficult to kind of spend time. So this is the theorem. What's important is that within this theorem, one can get exactly the distribution of uh, a test statistics mu when you test it under an hypothesis which is different than mu, mu prime. So this is a uh, two possible LHC experiment. So what I try to tell you is the following. Look at this plot. The blue area is actually predicted by Wilkes. It tells you the distribution of Q null under H null is chi square. The null can be signal or Bevan. Wall tell me what's the distribution of Q null under H alt. In other words, if I test the signal, it tells me what is the distribution after, of Q1 under H0. That's the orange area. The blue area is the distribution of Q1 under 1, under H1. It's chi square. What gives me a very complicated formula, which we derived in this paper that I showed you, of what is the distribution of Q1 under H0, or Q0 under H1. So I will stop for a second. It doesn't matter if you understand what is exactly what, but I want you to understand what does it give us. So if you have a question about what does it mean, what does it give us, please ask me. For I want you to understand what it gives us, not how it works, but what it gives us. Can somebody confirm that you understand what it gives us? Ilam, yeah, that's the question. So from the first example that uh, that you give, you gave uh, in the first part to uh, the example of the Wix and Vols theorem. Why, yeah, I guess the question in my mind, I guess the question in uh, the minds of the students is, uh, how do we, why do we move from that example to this one? What exactly do we gain by uh, because, because the we need? Have, uh, the reason we do it is because, because we now have closed formulas which are independent of the nuisance parameter. We don't care, we only care about the, the signal strength in a way. That's the only thing that we care. We only measure this and all the rest is absorbed and does not play a game. So the formulas are fixed. We actually have closed formulas, which means that once we have closed formula for these distributions, probably that's what you wanted to ask. Once we have closed formulas for this distribution, we don't need to generate any more zillions of Monte Carlo. When I generate a Monte Carlo of an LHC experiment, it can take, each event can take 10 minutes and I want to generate, say, millions of events. So it can take a lifetime to generate one LHC experiment. So maybe with a very powerful computer, it will take me one to three days to generate, to generate one bar in this distribution which means that I will need months to generate a whole distribution. Now, instead of generating the distribution, if I have closed formula that give me the red curve and the black curve here, then I don't need to generate these experiments. I have closed formulas and I simply now have a, an analytical formula 
for the behavior of the probability distribution function of the test statistic, either the null under the null or the null under the alternative. Once I have closed formulas, I can actually, it's realistic to do calculation, predictions, whatever you like. So this is the reason why we moved from the Neiman Pearson to this one, because we have closed formulas which are independent of what we call the new spectrometer or the background, if you like. And these closed formulas replace zillions of hours of computer time. And they allow us to do another thing, which I'll show in a second, which is the ask mode. So um, I also have a question. So if you were able to, like hypothetically, be, you, you were able to generate the required number of events in maybe two hours, <clears throat> let's say, um, would you would you, would you still prefer to use the asymptotic formula over the Monte Carlo toys, or okay, okay. I don't know many cases when you can produce in two hours and not in two months the required number of events. I don't know. Because he's uh, working on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, fine, fine. I will answer. So now it depends what is the p-value you want to do. If the p when you send me, you are able to generate. How many? If your p-value is 5%, then, then you want the error on the 5% to be small. So say you want to to generate uh, at least 10,000 events or more even. So can you do it in two hours? But if your p-value is one 10 to the minus seven, if you want to, to predict a discovery, I don't believe you can do it in two hours because you have to generate 10 billion events, at least, not 100 billion events. That you cannot do in two hours. So it depends what you want to do. If you want a p-value of 5%, maybe you can do it two hours and and in these cases, I would go for generation, but always check myself with asymptotics because, because we discovered after many, many years of experience, we discovered that, uh, <laughs> you won't believe it, but when you go to the tails of Monte Carlo, the tails of Monte Carlo sometimes give you uh, faulties. They give crazy things. When the Monte Carlo does the, the main thing, it does it well. But when you go to the tail, when the Monte Carlo gives you an experiment, it gives you a result which is an anomaly, sometimes it's because there was some uh, numerical problem in the Monte Carlo and some crazy results, some crazy uh, generation of a random number occurred there, and actually you can't trust your Monte Carlo. So I would do both of them anyway. Ailan, uh, I, I have maybe a, a question to continue on this. Uh, here you evoke uh, some problem in the Monte Carlo based maybe on the generation of random numbers, but also the theoretical shape of the Monte Carlo when, for example, you're missing higher orders or resummation or whatever, uh, you can also counter this effect by checking the, with the asymptotic formulas? I don't think so because uh, uh, let me see because we are talking about the distribution of the test statistic okay now the distribution of the test statistics um, I think the distribution of the test you say if you have a problem with the, if you don't understand higher orders yeah let, let's say it's a leading order Monte Carlo that you have generated and and you know it's just not that much reliable and you are using that for then your sure you want to use the asymptotic in this case yeah. that's what we discovered i mean katevi can tell you that we are still arguing about these things even 10 years after so my conclusion is uh, by the way i always say that no matter what you always have to generate events with your monte carlo because you have to see that the, the asymptotic starts to describe even the main part correctly, because sometimes you have a bug even in the impl implementation of the asymptotics. Okay. So you always, you always do both. But which one you rely on, it's a matter of taste. Sometimes some people will use the asymptotics, some people will use the, the data. I don't trust the data when the p-value is very, very small and when there are uncertainties in uh, whatever you do in the Monte Carlo. I always okay. trust more the asymptotics, but that, that's probably because uh, I am emotionally connected to it. But uh, this is my, my answer. Okay. 
okay, I think I should, can I move on? Because I have another 10 minutes, I need to go to another meeting because I sure, didn't take sure. into account correctly the difference in hours. And I ask you for next week, if you can, if I ask you, you could tell me one thing, either you give me two hours next week, because I don't want to be pressed in time, or alternatively, you give me a third lecture, you decide, okay? And then you don't have to answer me now, but uh, okay. I, I don't want to be pressed. I want to be able to answer question by question. I really try to make it short this time, but you see the questions come and good questions. Yeah. So I hope you understood why we moved to the symptotic, and I hope you understand that uh, will give me the theoretical, the theoretical behavior of the distribution of the null test statistics under null hypothesis. What gives me the theoretical behavior of the distribution of the null test statistics under the alternative hypothesis? So that's the only way I can get the power. You understand? So. The only way I can get the power, the power is actually, if you look at this plot here, then uh, if the observation is given by uh, this line here, it doesn't matter. This line here tells me some number and I want to know the power of this number. So it's the orange area to the right of this. This is the power. And the p-value is the, you don't even see it. It's so small. It's the area be below the red curve to the right here. It's very, very small. Okay, it's a tail. And the power is the orange. You, you wouldn't know the power if you didn't have this uh, asymptotic formula or the, you see, or you didn't have the, the distribution. But in this case, you see, if you really want to describe well the, 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 the tail of the red, you need zillion of events. It is so small. The asymptotic will give it to you much more accurate. Okay, maybe I, I still have time to understand, to, to explain to you what is the asymptote of data set and then we can stop here and continue next time. Suppose you write a proposal to get some money from an agency and you want to estimate the expected significance that you could achieve with the designed experiment. With a given analysis, at a given luminosity, at a given set of math. So there are two ways to do it. Option one will take a lot of time. You toss, for example, one million background only events. You get the distribution of the null hypothesis under the background. You test another one million signal plus background to get the orange curve and you find the. And now for each of the signal experiments, you find the significance, take the median of this, and this is your prediction. This may take ages. But there is a shortcut. It's called the Asimov data set. Okay, I don't have time to tell you the story why we call it the Asimov data set. I will just tell you what it is. The Asimov data set is an ensemble of simulated experiments. It is, is a statement that an ensemble of simulated experiments, which can take me ages to generate, can be replaced by one single representative one and actually one very, very simple one. So it tells you that one one can replace a whole ensemble of a million alternative hypothesis experiment with one data set that represents the typical experiment, which will give you the median. This Asimov data set delivers the desired median sensitivity. So one doesn't need to perform an ensemble of experiment. Just generate one data set and test and build your test statistics in one data set and check what is the significance that it gives you. And this Asimov data set is very, very simple. It's constructed such that when one uses it to evaluate the estimators for all parameters, one obtains the true parameter values. What do I mean? For example, suppose that I want to generate the Asimov data set that corresponds to the alternative hypothesis H1. Then I just set the number of N, N A to be S plus B, because this is the true value of S and the true value of B. As strange as it treats, the Asimov data set is not a Salin integer. So to show you how it works, now suppose I want to know the sensitivity of an experiment. So what I want to do, I generate the null experiment will give me, look at the top right plot, the distribution of the null test, test statistic is the red one. The distribution of the blue test statistic uh, uh, alternative is the blue one. And the 
I want to know what is my sensitivity here. So what I do is I want to generate alternative experiments. Each one gives me some test statistics and I want to look at the median test statistic, which is the green one, and look at the p-value corresponds to this. So the p-value will be the area under the red to the right of the green line. Area under the red to the right of the green line. So instead of generating all the experiment, I can simply set n equal s plus b, and the test statistics that I will get will be the Asimov test statistics. Give me the median immediately. Here is an example where the Asimov data set is the green line here. And if I do lots of Monte Carlo alternative hypothesis and take the median of these, all these bars, I get the red one. And you see that they are very, very similar. I have only four minutes left, so I prefer, actually, there are not many slides, only five slides. I prefer to let you digest this and do it next time, because they go together. And that was, uh, I will do next time the Q mu and Q zero. So if the, the, there is a, I have some minutes to take questions here. So maybe if there is still a question here, I can answer. Okay. Some questions? Now, uh, uh, Kitevi, I have an idea. Let them read the slides. And if you can send me simply a list of questions if they come up with, I, I think you also recorded this. Right, you have a recorder here, right? Recorder. Yes, 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 it's recorded. So, so up, uh, ask them until, uh, say, uh, Tuesday next week to send me, you can give them an email to send me questions if they have. I will try to answer them at the beginning of next lecture. Is that acceptable by you? Yeah, that's, that's fine. And we can also give you a third lecture. Yeah. Ah, ah, if you can give me a third lecture, it's better because statistics is always a pain. So I prefer that, that that was a lot of material and uh, I need to go into admin. So I prefer that we stop here and, uh, and please listen to the lecture again, read the, read the slides again. And uh, if you have a question, please do not hesitate. I promise to give an answer next lecture. Okay. Okay, yeah, that's fine. <clears throat> so we stop here, right? Okay, uh, so thank you very much. And thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, please uh, send your question via email to Ailam, and uh, he will try to answer by the beginning of the of next lecture. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you, Ailam, and thank you. thanks everyone for joining. Thank you. Bye. Thank bye you bye. very much. Thank you. Bye. Very much. Okay.